God bless you, our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, and welcome back to another Bible study. Before Pastor Harden comes forth and we start in the new book, Ezra, he's going to do chapters one and two. Let us all go before the Lord in prayer. Blessed Lord of heaven and earth, holy and righteous Father, the only holy God there is, the only holy Father there is, we bless your holy name. You are worthy to be praised, Lord of heaven and earth, righteous King of the universe, righteous judge. We bless your holy name. We assemble before you, your majesty, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Prince of Peace and the Prince of Life, our only Lord and Savior, our only Messiah, our King, the Prince over the kings of the earth. Father, we thank you. We thank you for blessing us to be able to learn your word today. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, O God, for being a very present help. We thank you for making a way through your blessed son, Jesus, that we can come to you, O God, and we can cry our tears and we can cast our cares and cast our burdens and seek you for help. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending your son into this world to grant us peace, to grant us eternal life, to grant us salvation and freedom from the bondage and the ravages of sin. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your grace and your loving kindness. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your compassion and your care towards us. Father, we pray that this Bible study is taught the way that you want it taught. We pray that everybody listening, that they would be edified and that they would be encouraged. And we ask if you would bless everyone to understand your word and to understand your will for their lives. We pray for courage, O oh God, for your people, courage to stand upon righteousness. We pray, O oh God, that your will be done in all of our lives. We believe you, Father, and we pray for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done in all the earth as it is in heaven. And Father God, in all of our lives, we pray that your kingdom would be obvious and that it would be evident that we would be those that light, that city set on a hill, that we would be those candles burning for the glory of you, O oh God, for the glory of your son and for the glory of your kingdom. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit dwelling in these earthen vessels, teaching us, correcting us, comforting us, ordering our footsteps. Father, thank you. We bless you, O God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many blessings you bestow upon us all. We pray, Father God, these things in the name of Jesus. We bless you, O God. Amen. Let us now join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible study lesson. God bless you. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of the United Body of Christ Church, which is an online ministry. On behalf of my family and myself, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome back your families, to welcome back yourselves, back to another uh, broadcast, back to another Bible study. Brand new book uh, today that we'll be coming out of, uh, Ezra. And there's a lot of interesting uh, things taking place here, so we definitely uh, want to get to it. Uh, before we get started, first I, I give honor to the Most High God, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the, the Father being the chef, the Son being the bread that the Father has prepared for us to receive. That bread is also the word of this word. The bread of life, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. We also take this opportunity to honor the Holy Spirit, uh, the presence of the Most High God that dwells inside of us. Uh, so to God be the glory, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit that has moved your family and yourselves, my family and myself, that we can come together even through this broadcast, that we may sub commune and fellowship one with another. My wife, and, and that's, I wanted to also mention my wife being the one the, in the uh, background. She works the background here to make sure that the videos are processed and, 
edited and uploaded. She's also the one uh, which has opened this Bible study up in prayer. So I bless God for her. Uh, God's goodness been upon my family and me. I would be remiss uh, if I didn't honor the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and if I didn't pay tribute to him for his goodness concerning me and my family by giving me a wife that's faithful to him and that loves her family, faithful unto all of us. So to God be the glory. Uh, if, if you haven't already done so, um, download if you could, uh, at, at your leisure, if you will, uh, our we have a uh, uh, um, our app is should now be available for Fire TV devices. So not just the Amazon tablet, but Fire TV devices. Our app should be available there. Uh, the Lord has really moved us to to put put the platform out there, um, put put the Bible study in more people's hands the digital age in which we live. So uh, to God be the glory for, for allowing us to, the platforms uh, to make his word available. on. So again, we should be available uh, by our website, Android and Apple devices, uh, the uh, Roku devices, if you will, the Apple TV devices, also uh, Fire TV devices, and then Google TV, they tell me so. We haven't been able to check, at least for the Google TV, but for every other platform, uh, you, you should be able to download the app, which is United Body of Christ. So, to God be the glory. I'm not going to keep you. I don't, we, Old Testament names, as far as the pronunciation of them, it's, it's always been a, a, a task for me. So, the author has, has uh, made sure that he, he's given us enough information about the 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 the, uh, the citizens uh, that were coming out of exile to go into uh, uh, Jerusalem there so for gamma I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I mispronunciate the names amen so just bear with me we got to walk this thing out together you and I we'll work it out just just bear with me is if, if, if I'm tearing the names up, you know, just, just fast forward. If it's, getting to, <laughs> if it's getting too much for you, just just get ahead of me. I'll catch up with you, okay? But um, we'll get through it. We'll get through it together. So without any further ado, we'll get right into it. Man may not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord our God. Again, today we're looking at Ezra. Uh, hopefully uh, chapters 1 and 2 to get through. Amen? So let's get it. Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord uh, by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of, king, of the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom, and he and put it also in writing. Now, let's stop right there just for a moment. I want to give you some, some background here uh, concerning this book. When the children of Israel disobeyed God, we already know that the, the, the tribes were broken up after King Solomon. The, 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 the 12 tribes of Israel kind of went into a civil war, if you will. And the tribes in the, the, the tribes broke up. So you end up having ten tribes of the north and then two southern tribes in the south. The two tribes in the south became one tribe, and they were just known as Judah. But they were comprised of Judah and Benjamin. And those two tribes kind of became one tribe known as again Judah. Now we already know. In previous Bible study, Bible study lessons that the 10 northern tribes had gone into exile. Um, those were the, the, uh, the Assyrians had came in and, and uh, devastated uh, Israel and, and then took the 12 tribes, I'm sorry, took the 10 tribes into exile. Okay, so you still had the, uh, you still had the bottom uh, two tribes left, which was Judah, known as Judah at the bottom. After the Assyrian ring, the Babylons came in and conquered the Assyrians. 
And so that being the case, the, the, uh, the Babylonians came in and they decimated um, the, 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 the uh, southern two tribes there. Uh, they decimated Judah and they were the ones that took Judah into exile. Okay, so I want to kind of give you just a quick, you know, some kind of a cliff note here just to kind of get through so we can have a backdrop of what we're talking about today. So now, 70 years later, God said that God allowed it to happen that they would be taken into exile. There were three separate deportations of the children of Israel, which is the southern two tribes. And I actually want to read, read about the three, uh, the three different times that they, that they were sent over to Babylon. So if you will, briefly, go with me to Jeremiah. Uh, and we want to look at, we want to go to Jeremiah chapter 52, and let's look at verses 28 through 30. Jeremiah chapter 52, verses 28 through 30. Here's what the word of the Lord said. This is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. In the, in the seventh year, 3,000 Jews and three and twenty. So three thousand and twenty-three Jews happened during the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's ring. And then in the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar's ring, he carried away captive from, from Jerusalem eight hundred and thirty-two persons. So the first time in the seventh year of his ring, this is the seventh year of the Babylonian ring. Nebuchadnezzar uh, invaded uh, uh, Judah and invaded Jerusalem and took into exile 3,023. Now, it's thought that these, the numbers that are given here are just the men, not including women and children. It's thought that these are just men. Uh, but nevertheless, that being said, the first count or the first deportation was during this, what is it, during the seventh year? Uh, that, that total being 3,022, or 23, rather. The second deportation happened in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. In the 18th year, he carried away 832 persons. The third deportation, this happened uh, in the 23rd year. So in the 3 and 20th year of Nebuchadnezzar's, this is uh, Nebuzaradan, uh, the captain of the guard. He carried away of the Jews uh, 745 people. So 745 that, the, that, that Nebuchadnezzar gave the, um, the green light uh, to his general. Uh, so that's three separate deportations, one in the seventh year, one in the 18th year, and one in the 23rd year. Uh, and, and, and so those three deportations grabbed a total of 4,600 people um, from, to be deported or, or to go into exile. So three different times. So that's important. You want to have, we got to have that part right there, three different times. Now, what Ezra begins to show us is that there were, because time was served, they were sentenced to 70 years. Remember, God allowed it to happen. So because of Israel's sin, okay? So for 70 years, they were in exile. After 70 years were complete, uh, it was, they were considered as time served. So God allowed them to go back. Ezra the book of Ezra shows us because there was three different deportations to Babylon under King Cyrus, under the Persian rule. Remember, the Persians, now the Persians have conquered the Babylonians. So now the Persians were the new world, world power. At first, it was the Babylonians being the world power. And under the Babylonians' world power, the children of Israel were in exile. Now the Persians have conquered the Babylonians, the Persians being a world power. It's under their power or their ring that the children of Israel are able to go back. Under Ezra, Ezra is showing us that because there were three different deportations into Babylon, 
there are now three deportations, or not deportations, there are now three, um, three different events of them going back to their land. Three deportations in to, to, to Babylon, three deportations out of exile. Okay, and I would say out of Babylon, but at this time it's the Persian Empire. So it's three deportations from Persia. Amen. So I want you to understand that. And when we focus on the, the three deportations leaving the Persian Empire, the first wave of people going back to Jerusalem and to the land of Israel, the first going back focused, or there was three different focuses. The first focus was on the temple itself. The second group that went back was they were reinstituting the law. The third group that goes back were building the wall. So that was the, that's the primary uh, focus of Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah, these two books are going to go hand in hand. So Lord willing, we get through Ezra, we get right in to Nehemiah because they go hand in hand. They're locked they're locked interchangeably. And so Nehemiah is going to focus on the wall itself. Okay? So remember, they were taken into exile three different times and leaving. There's three different waves of them coming back. The first wave had to deal with the, the, uh, the, the, the building of the temple. So that's establishing not only the temple of the Lord, but establishing the covenant, you know, re realigning them with the covenant of God. Um, that realigning them in the, as far as their religious values. The second wave is the law. They have to understand the word of God. They have to understand the law. And the third is the wall. So I want you to have that kind of backdrop. And I hope that I wasn't as redundant telling it. And I hope you understand it, the clarity of it. But... That's what Ezra is going to focus on, the three different uh, waves that are going, the, 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 the three different uh, uh, waves of people that are going back, okay? So that's that. So now in the first year of, of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Now we know, as, as we already read this, but there are some things that we needed to pick apart here. What did Jeremiah say that the words of the Lord might be fulfilled? I got my notes here. Let's look at what he says here. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 25. We want to look at verses 12 through 14. Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 12 through 14. All right, here's the word of the Lord. It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. And that, and that nation said the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual desolations. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I've pronounced against it. Even all that's written in this book, which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve them, shall serve themselves of them also. And I will recompense them according to their deeds, according to the works of their own hands. So that's one thing that Jeremiah prophesied. Let's go to the other thing here. <coughs> uh, let's go to stay in Jeremiah. Let's look at chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, and let's look at verse 10. For thus said the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. So now we understand this verse here. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. So we just got done reading about what it is that God is looking to fulfill. In order to get the children of Israel uh, away, he had to change the administration out. He needed to change the world power out. And he allowed the Syrians, now I'm sorry, he allowed the Persians rather to come in and to decimate the Babylonians. And then it's under the Persian reign 
that God raised up his own man, which is the king of the Persians, which was Cyrus. I also would like to take, take uh, an opportunity to read something concerning that. If you would, go with me to uh, Proverbs. Uh, let's look at uh, 21 and 1. Proverbs 21 and 1. I find this rather interesting here. Look at what this says here. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water, and he turneth it whatsoever he will. So it gives us an opportunity to really understand this verse in whole. That God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation through all, throughout all the kingdom and put it also in writing. <clears throat> so that's we understand that God that that when he got stirred up to he was like, man, you know, the Lord has gave me all the kingdoms of the earth, but he didn't put me here for my enjoyment. He got me here to do something. And I know what I think I know what it is. I'm going to take my authority and release the Jews back to their homeland so that they can build the, their God a temple. And, and God put that, God stirred up his spirit. God began to move his heart towards himself. Amen. This is real powerful here. I digress. Let's continue here. Verse 2. Thus said king, thus says Cyrus, king of the Persians, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among all of his people? Who is there among you of all of his people? His God be with them and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. So, again, this is real powerful because after they served their time, God made sure that he had the administration traded out, changed out, put in his, put in his new guy. And, and under King Cyrus, God moved his heart to, to say, hey, it's time for y'all to go back and, and, and build. And don't just go back, but build him a temple. Why are they building him a temple? Because God wants to dwell with his people, right? It's not just about time, time served. God still has a covenant with his children, and he wants to rekindle that relationship with them. So it's time. OK, 70 years were completed. So Cyrus is saying where those of you that are going back to Jerusalem, your fellow men, wherever you be, whatever communities here in, in the Persian Empire that you reside in, you know, get ready to send them back with some good stuff. Let's I get out of the way of the scripture. Let's read. Whosoever remaineth any place wherein he sojourneth. Let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So <coughs> he writes this declaration, this de he decreed it to say that you have to go back. And when you go back, your attention should be to build. And those of you that are seeing them off, see them off with gold and silver and livestock you know, camels and donkeys and horses and what have you. Also, put something in their hand so that when they go back, they can offer it to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. Right? Put something in their hand. Don't just leave them. Don't let them go away empty-handed. Put something in their hand so that they can dedicate it to their God. Now, this is God's man. That's God is God's man saying this. Those of you that are neighbors to those that are, that are going back, fill their coffers with something. Put something in their hands to help them on their journey because they got to take a journey to go back. So that, I, I thought that was real powerful to see this. It's God, and it's really God's kindness. Hi, God. It's his kindness. What did they do for God to be so kind to them? For him to visit them. And God kept his word. Remember what he told Jeremiah after the end of 70 years? You going to come back and visit this place? God kept his word. He's faithful. 
And so he tells the children of Israel, as you're going back, he's speaking, God's spirit is speaking through, through the king. And the king can't help but tell his citizens, y'all give them something to go back with. See them off the right way. They came in here the wrong way. See them off the right way. That's powerful. I digress. Verse 5. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priest and the Levites and with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Remember, as we read Azariah, the first wave of the people is all about building the temple. The second wave that goes back is establishing the law, the covenant of God with them, the law itself. The third wave is all about the wall. So that's why we're reading here is we're reading about this first wave. The, the, the primary mission here, the goal is to build up the temple so they have a meeting place between God and man. Okay. So they were all about. So all of they that were about them strengthened their hands with the vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, with the precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. Look at that word there, that were willingly, that, that they gave voluntarily. The, the, the king didn't force them to give up nothing. He was like, just don't, don't see, see them off the right way. Give them something for their journey. But he never forced it. People that wanted to do right, people that wanted to give, they gave because it was the right thing to do. And the word, it's, it's amazing that the scriptures put that in there, that they made it a point to say willingly offered. It was the right thing to do. Also, Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of, the, out of Jerusalem. And he put them in the house of his gods. So that's what when Nebuchadnezzar pulled the children of Israel, the, remember the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, when he pulled them out of Jerusalem, he also raided the temple of God and pulled out all the treasures and he put them in his place. Well, what happened is under a new administration, they began to right the wrong of the old administration. And so when the children of Israel started going back to their own homeland, uh, the, the king of Persia was like all of the treasures of the house of the temple of God that that Nebuchadnezzar took out and put in his pagan God's houses, pull those out of there and send them back to the children of Israel so that they can put that back in its rightful place in the temple of the Lord. That's a, God is rewriting. God is, is, is making all the wrong right again. OK. And what was amazing is Cyrus didn't know anything about God, about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's only one God. Cyrus didn't know anything about him. He knew of him, but he didn't know him particularly, right? But he knew of him, and he was like, look, it's him that allowed me to, to, to reign and rule. So I, I kept respect for him. When you go back to your place, pray for me. Pray for me, and then I'm going to show you the way to get back, okay? So in verse 8, even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Midrath, Midrathat, the treasurer, and, the, and numbered them unto Shazbazar, the prince of Judah. So what's happening is uh, King Cyrus tells his treasurer to go into the, go into the storehouse and pull out all of these, uh, 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 all of the treasures that ba the Babylonians have pulled out. Make sure you get every last one of it, and then give it to the to the leader uh, of those going back. And at this time, the leader is uh, Shazbazar. He's the leader of the exiles that are going back to, to to Jerusalem. Make sure you count it out to him so that he can have it to take with him. And this is the number of them: thirty chargers of gold. A thousand chargers of silver, nine and twenty knives, twenty-nine knives, thirty basins of gold, thirty basins of silver. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, four hundred and ten, and other vessels, a thousands. 
so I actually kind of wrote this down to kind of break it down for you. Gold basins, 30. Silver basins, 100. Silver incense burners, 29. Gold bowls, 30. Silver bowls, 410. Miscellaneous items were like 1,000. So that's, that's what you get here. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. All these that Shazbazar bring up with them to the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. So it was his job, uh, being the, the leader of the exiles, uh, to go back. It was his job to make sure that all of this stuff got put back into the house of the temple of the Lord. But it, it needed to be rebuilt and repaired, repaired and rebuilt. Okay? So that's going to take care of chapter 1. Hopefully we, we got everything covered. Um, the amount of, of those that, that, that were uh, deported into, um, into Babylon, uh, we have the return. Uh, the first return is going to happen under Zerubbabel. The second return happens under Ezra. The third return happens under Nehemiah. Zerubbabel was in charge, of, 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 again, of the temple. Ezra is in charge of the law. Nehemiah will be in charge of the wall. So that's, we want to make sure that's being taken care of uh, as far as uh, mentioning that there. And I think I've covered everything that I was supposed to cover here. All right, let's get into, uh, let's get into some work here. <laughs> this, let's get into work chapter two. This is it's where it gets a little interesting with the pronunciation of names here, but it, it is what it is. So chapter 2, Ezra chapter 2, those who returned from captivity, let's talk about them. Now these are the children uh, of the province that went up out of the captivity, of those which had been carried away, uh, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, everyone unto his own city, or everyone unto his city. So now... This whole summary is about the first wave here. This is the first wave. This is not all three waves. This is the first wave, okay? Which came with Zerubbabel. Remember, we just got done saying that Zerubbabel was, was the leader. Of, it, it was the head of the first wave, or, or he was the priest of the first wave. So you got, so which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, which was the priest, Nehemiah. Now, remember we just said that Nehemiah was the, was the one in charge of the wall. This is not the same Nehemiah. This is just someone who has the name of Nehemiah. Okay? And this, this word, Sariah, this really Azariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Misphar, Bigvi, Rehum, Baana, the number of men of the people of Israel. Okay? Now, for my notes, I'm, I've, I've got some notes here that I got printed out, and I'm just going to go through my notes, but they should keep in line with the verses that we read, okay? So you can follow me as I go through my notes to give you the breakdown of the people that are coming during this first wave. It's going to correspond with the scripture, so you can follow me. Uh, through the scripture, but I'm just reading from my notes because it's easier for me to teach it this way. Okay, so verse three, the family of Perish, uh, there was 2,172, 2,172. Okay, uh, and, and again, these are the number of the people that came unto Israel. This is the first wave. So the family of Shephatiah, 372. The family of Era, 775, that's verse 5. Verse 6, the family of Pehath Moab, these are the descendants of Jeshua and Joab, the number of 2,812, 2,812. Verse 7, the family of Elam, 1,254. Verse 8, the family of Zatu, 945. Verse 9, the family of Zakai. Uh, 760. Verse 10, the family of Bani, 642. 11, the family of uh, Bibai, 623. The family of Asgad, 1,222. Verse 13, the family of Adonikim, six, uh, 666. 666. 
verse 14, the family of Bigvi, 2,056. Verse 15, the family of Adin, 454. Verse 16, the family of Ater, these are the descendants of Hezekiah. There were 98. Verse 17, the family of Bezai, 323. Verse 18, the family of Jorah, 112. Verse 19, the family of Hashem, 223. Verse 20, the family of Gibbar, 95. Verse 21, these are the people of Betham, 123, verse 22, these are the people of Natofa, 56, uh, 23, the people of Anath, Anath, Anath 128, uh, verse 24, the people of Beth, Beth Asmath, Beth Asmath, 42, so let me pronounce, let me try again to pronounce that Beth Asmavetha, as Asmavetha, forty-two, verse twenty-five. The people of Kerth, Kerth Jerem, uh, Kerth Jemim, Kerth, uh, Kepariah, and Birath. <laughs> there was seven hundred and forty-three. I, I thought I was going to tear them up. So it is what it is. Verse twenty-six. The people of Ramoth and Geba, six hundred twenty-one. 27, the people of Michmash, 122. 28, the people of Bethel and I, 223. 20, verse 29, the citizens of Nebo, there is 52. Verse 30, these are the citizens of Michbish, 156. Verse 31, the citizens of West Elam, uh, El Elam. Let me uh, see if, if I wrote that down. The children of the other, of the other Elam, uh, these are, are 1,254. So the children of West Elam is what it comes down to. The citizens of Haram, verse 32, is 320. The citizens of Lot, Hadad, and Ono, 725. Okay. Uh, verse 35, 30, 34, the citizens of Jericho is 30, 345. Verse 35, the citizens of um, Sinai, 3,630. Verse 36, these are the priests who returned from exile. So the family of, of Jedediah, uh, this is through the line of Jeshua, Jediah. This is 973 from the family of Jediah. Uh, verse 37, the family of Emmer, 1,052. Verse 38, the family of Pasher, 1,247. Uh, 39, 39, the family of Haram, 1,017. So these are, in verse 40, these are the Levites who returned from exile. So the Levites, the children of Jeshua, and Cadmiel of the children of uh, Hadavia, 70 and 4, so 74 of them. These are the descendants of uh, uh, Hoda, Hodaviah. Hodaviah, so I guess that's how you pronounce that. Now, we get into the singers and the, and the, and the porters. Verse 41, the singers of the family of Asaph, 128. Verse 42, the porters or the gatekeepers of the families of Shalom, Adar, Talman, Akkup, uh, Hatita, Hatata, Hatita, and Shobai. There's one, 139. And uh, that's verse 42. Verse 43, the descendants of the, the descendants of the following temple servants returned from exile. So uh, this is verse 43. So when you see the word uh, Nethanim, these, that's, those are temple servants. So the temple servants, the children of uh, Ziha, Ziha, the children of Hesupa, Hesupha, and the children of Taboath, the children of Keras, the children of Siah, uh, the children of Paddan, the children of Lebanon, uh, 
Lebanon, the children of Hagabah, the children of Akup, the children of Hag Hagab, the children of Sh uh, Shalmai, the children of Hanan. Verse 47, the children of Giddel, the children of Gehar, the children of uh, Rei, the children of Reason. In verse 48, the children of Nekoda, the children of Gazim. Verse 49, the children of Uzzah, the children of uh, Pesia, Pasia, the children of Besai. Verse 50, the children of Asna, the children of Mahunam, the children of Nephusim. Verse 51, the children of Bakuk, Babuk, the children of Hakufa, the children of Harha, the children of Basleth, the children of Mehida, the children of Harsha. Verse 53, the children of Barcos, the children of Sisera, the children of Thama. Uh, Thama. Verse 54, the children of Neziah, the children of Hatifa. Verse 55, the children of Solomon's servant, the children of Sotiah, the children of Sofer Sophereth, the children of Peruda. Verse 56, the children of Jaela, the children of Darkon, the children of Giddel. Verse 57, the children of Seth, Sephatiah, the children of Hattil, the children of Pacharoth, of, Ze, of Zebim, the children of Amon, Amai. Verse 58, all the Nethanims, all the servants of the temple and the children of, Sol, and the children of Solomon temples uh, were 390 and 2. So, so all of those, all of the temple servants uh, numbered to be 392 and it gives you the families where they their, their genealogy of where they came from okay verse 59 and these were they which went up from tell uh, tell Mila tell Harsa Sherub Adon, and Emmer but they could not show their father's house and their seed whether they were of Israel so again as as we chrono chronicalize the genealogy of those that have come, there were some who couldn't be traced back to the to those that are that were originally from from Judah and Israel. They couldn't be traced. Their genealogy couldn't be traced, and that's what the scripture is saying here. Verse sixty: the children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nicoda, six hundred and fifty and two, and of the children of the priest the children of Habiah, the children of Kaz, the children of Brasilia, which took a wife of the daughters of Bar, um, I said Brasilia, but Barzillai, Barz, Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. So when they married the, um, when they end up marrying um, Barzal, Barzillai, the daughters of Barzillai, Instead of the daughters taking their name, they end up taking their name, right? And so their genealogy couldn't be traced. Verse 62, these, these sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, were they as polluted, put from the priesthood. And the, and the Tershatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things, uh, till there stood up a priest with the Urim and the Thummim, and the Thummim. And so, what what's happening is the the the, the Tershatha, that's the governor. So the governor says to them, "I know you're of the priest order, but we don't have any record of your or, of you being a, where you where you hail from, the originality of you." And so, until we clear, until we get this m matter cleared up. You can't partake of what the other priests partake of. And, and so they go on to say, once we have a designated priest, we'll have them seek God for his counsel through the Urim and the Thunum, the, you know, the way that they do that, the way they communicate to God. It's, you know, whether it's <laughs> the roll of dice, whatever the method is, the Urim and the Thunum, that's how they were going to communicate with God to get his divine counsel on how to proceed with this tribe of people, with this particular tribe of people here. So, so again, the governor tells them that they can't partake of any of the meals that the priest partake of. And he's saying that for their own good. 
The whole congregation together was 40 and 2,300 and three scores. So 42,360. And let me catch up on my notes here. Yeah, so 43,360 people returned to Judah. Uh, verse, 50, verse 65, besides their servants and maids of whom there were 7,337. So again, we have uh, 7,337. There were, there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. Their horses were 736, so 736. Their mules, 240 and five, 245. Their camels, 435, 435 camels. Their asses, 6,720. And some of the chief of the fathers, when they were come to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, they offered freely for the house of God to set it up in its place. So they went, so some of the, the, the heads of the families, of the, all the families that we've read, when they got to Jerusalem, the first thing they did was go to where the, where the temple was before it was ransacked and kind of destroyed. And they offered to rebuild it right in its place, not to move it to a different place, but to rebuild it in its original spot to repair and to rebuild and then it was in it's there that they wanted to also do the offerings there amen so they wanted to that was of most importance to them to do the offerings so they gave after their ability unto the treasures of the work uh, unto the treasure of the work three score one thousand drams of gold so i actually got the, the the breakdown here it's 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 easier for me to give you the breakdown here so when they arrived at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the family leaders made a voluntary offering towards the rebuilding of God's temple. So they gave as much as they could. Their gifts totaled up to 61,000 gold coins. Um, and then what do we have for the silver? Uh, 5,000 pounds of silver and then 100 priest garments. So again, that's 61,000 gold coins, 5,000 um, 5,000 pounds of silver, and then, again, to, to repeat, 100 robes for the priest's garments, okay? So the priest and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters and the temple, the, the, the temple service, the Nethanims, they dwelt in their cities. So these are they that dwelt right there around Jerusalem itself. And then you have others that went throughout the suburbs of Israel and all Israel in their cities. So again, there was the, the porters, which were the gatekeepers, the, the temple servants was with the Nephanim, the Nephanims, and then the, those others, they all took housing around Jerusalem so that they would be close to the, to the temple and the building. And then the others, repeating myself, that they would be going into to the suburbs somewhat. So that's, I told you that was going to be some rough work for me going through these names here, but... I wanted to at least, uh, I thought it would be much easier to print myself out some notes, some of a breakdown, and go through the breakdown, and, and, and so that we can get through it together. Amen. God, I thank you for the opportunity to come before your people, to share the word of God with them, to feed them, to edify them spiritually, and to show them how you are a God of your word. How no matter if the children of Israel were put away for 70 years you were still there with them to see them through their captivity and then to bring them back to the land and so that things could not only could the temple be rebuilt but even your relationship with them can be rebuilt these things are written for our understanding to show us your character to see what kind of God that you are how you were a God for them and you are a God unto us that you, we see that you are no respecter of persons. And in great, it gives me joy to know this about you. It gives me joy, Father, to share this about you to others. 
Father, and how organized and orderly these events are and how you, it don't matter what the, who the leadership of the land is, that you still have access to a person's heart. You're a good God. You're a very, very good and faithful God. So we take this opportunity to acknowledge you, to acknowledge your word, to acknowledge your ways. Continue to rule and reign. And as we're seeing and reading about the temple being rebuilt and restored and rehabbed and repaired, do that also unto us. And let it be us that offer gifts unto you willingly as you begin the rebuilding and restructure process of us. Help us to give unto you that of our holiness, that of our faithfulness unto you. Because you're faithful unto us. Father, you're worthy of all that were given to the people to give to you. You're worthy of it. And then even of our holiness to give unto you, Father, you are worthy of it. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being so good unto us individually and collectively. Continue to have your way in these Bible studies and even in the, the audience lives individually and collectively. Help them see the character of the God whom we're reading about, the God in, in whom we serve. Help them see you. Help them to navigate their journey towards you. Help them to come out of their former captivities and to come into their liberties in Christ. And navigate the path to you, Father. Help them to navigate it. Understanding that narrow is the way to life and broad is this path to destruction. So lead and guide for your good name's sake. You are abundantly good and merciful always and at all times. We bless the name of the Lord our God the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. To God be the glory forever and ever. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go with me quickly uh, to Matthew 11. I'll read through these very quick. This is the path. You can always find, uh, if you go to our website, you can always find the path laid out for you to obtain the gift of salvation. We've read about what's going to happen to those that walk contrary uh, to the ordinances and the precepts of God. Those that are in con contradiction of his righteousness. The fate that will befall them. Here is how, here's how you are saved from that. It starts with Jesus Christ offering you an invitation to be saved. He says, come unto me. This is Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The one thing you got to understand is he, he, has his, he has the best life that he wants to give you. He's got your, he's got your interests at heart that he wants you to come and join him, be a part of the family, come and be partakers of his kingdom, right? And then if he says, take and learn, he says, learn of me. Forget what they've been saying, what the world has been saying about me. You try me for yourself and come and learn of me. And what, and what you'll find out is how, is how I have your best interests at heart. You'll find that out, that I'm for you before I'm against you. You'll find that out. But you but when you come to him, you have to turn away from the world. Because 
it's not going to work in the kingdom of God. Remember, we spent the, the, better, the better part of an hour and a half talking about how the old world is going to fade away. And God is ushering in the new world. He's ushering in the new heaven and the new earth. And the old is going to be done away with. And so now is the time for us to prepare for what will be. And Christ is offering us, the Messiah, Emmanuel, he is offering that platform, that bridge of transition and change unto us. Amen? Go with me to Romans chapter 11, or chap Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Romans 10, verses 9 through 13. This is how you accept Jesus as Lord. This is how you accept his invitation. You first turn away from the world because when he says come unto me, that means leave the world behind and come to me. Now you commit to making him Lord of your life. Romans chapter 10 verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You know how you give your wedding vows. You say, do, the, the man of God will say, do you take this man or do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded husband or your lawfully wedded wife. And you say, I do, right? Well, this is what you're saying to Jesus, that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, you're saying, I do make you Lord of my life. That's what you're doing. I make you Lord of my life. I commit to marrying you and to obeying you, okay? And shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's factoring in confession and faith that you believe you believe that Jesus is the only begotten son of God that laid down his life for us and was and was brought back to life after three days and three nights and is alive forevermore and he is the one that will reign and rule in the millennium the safekeeping of our souls have been placed in his hand Amen. And if you believe it and you confess that he is Lord, you are saved. What are you being saved from? We just covered that. We just covered that. That's you're being saved from the wrath of God that's going to fall upon the whole the whole world. Amen. I will go back and reference the Gospel of John, chapter three and thirty six, but I want you to do it. It's basically saying what we've already said. Your, re your rejection of your rebellion against God and your rejection of his only begotten son. And, and that's the wrath. But if you take this path, you enjoy you, 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 uh, excuse me. If you take this path, you're removed from the wrath that's going to come upon the earth. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And so there's good and bad. That as God would punish the children of Israel, he will punish his children that are Gentiles. And the good is that a God was saving his children, the Jews. He's also looking to save us, the Gentiles. So there is no difference with God when it comes to salvation being offered between the Jews and the Gentiles. There's no difference when it comes to that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is going to save you. He promises to do that. But you have to put yourself in position to be saved by turning away from your sins. That's repentance. By confessing Jesus as Lord. Okay? Calling upon him and letting him know that I make you Lord of my life. Quickly go with me to 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is 
letting you know this is part of that path. When Christ says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, this is what it means to come to him, turning away from your sins. And then let God know, let him know through prayer what it is that you repented of so that it never gets brought up again. God even takes it out of the enemy because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. At, at this time, he has, he has permission to go to the throne of God to accuse us right there at the throne. But the time is going to come to where he's going to be put into the pit. But until he's put into the pit, those things that you've been forgiven of and that the blood of the lamb has washed you clean of, God doesn't give the enemy permission to, to bring it up because God himself is not trying to hear about it. And as long as you turned away from it, you disarm the enemy. You take away his argument against you. That's, that's the bottom line. But if you're still living in your sin, then the enemy is constantly bringing it up because he wants God to penalize you. He wants God to turn him loose on you. Okay? And so once you do what you're supposed to and you start walking right with God, then the enemy has to, he has to get up off of you. He can't even bring a case against you. He could try to make one, but he can't bring one. He can try to tempt you, but as long as you're covered in the armor of God and you resist him, he has nothing to complain about at the throne of God. Amen? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If you're not honest about what's broken about you, then you can't be saved. If you live in deceit and dishonesty, there's nothing that the word can do for you. Amen? Lastly, and quickly, go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. And I'll just read through this. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. And what Peter is saying here is that Surely those that have gathered here in this upper room on this particular day of Pentecost, that's the backdrop of what's going on here. Surely those that are here, it's hard to believe that any of you would have taken nails and drive them through the hands of Jesus, crucifying them on the cross, taking nails and driving them through the feet as he was crucified on the cross. But your lifestyle, those unrepented sins, those sins that you haven't repented of, that, that makes you just as guilty as those that had done that to him. Okay, you may say, I, I, I'm not doing all those things. But sin in your life, period, makes you just as guilty, guilty as those that had nailed Jesus to the cross. Now, when they heard this, they were convicted or they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and, bro men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to get our life in order? When God convicts us, he's letting us know that there's something amiss within our lives and it's going to cost us if we don't get those things reconciled between him and ourselves. If we don't do our part to, to get a handle on that stuff, it's going to cost us, right? And God is convicting you to try to move you to take action, okay? So don't disregard those convictions. God got, he has that there for a reason. And that means that he hasn't given up on you. When he convicts you, it's because he hasn't given up on you. So stop giving up on yourself. Do something about what's happening with your situation. Take hold of it before God turns you over. You don't want him to turn you over. Amen? When I say turn you over, turn you over to the enemy or turn you over to yourself. That's the worst that he can do to you. So Peter says, repent, turn away from your sins first and foremost. Then Peter gives us the instruction, be ye baptized, you know, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the, for the remission of sins. Now, let's talk about the ceremony of baptism. Christ was nailed to the cross, laying down his life, meaning that he died on the cross, taken down off the cross and laid to rest in the tomb. He was laid to rest. 
in a tomb. Remember, he was dead. For three days and for three nights, he laid to rest. After three days and three nights, he was brought back to life. Laid to rest, brought back to life. Okay? When we go through the ceremony of baptism, we are uh, some fully submerged in the water. That represents us being buried in Christ Jesus. Okay? When we go down into the water, being fully submerged, we are buried in Jesus Christ. When we come up out of the water, we are resurrected in Jesus Christ. Your old man goes down, your new man comes up, all of your sins are washed away. You remember in our Bible study, we talked about God getting rid of the old to make room for the new. This is the process of you inheriting the new, your name being counted amongst those in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is that process. Your old man has to be done and away with. Your new man has to come forth so that you can take part in the new world uh, uh, with the kingdom of God. Amen. That starts now. Your training of inheriting that which is to come starts now. But the old man has to go down. The new man has to come up. Amen. So that's the ceremony of baptism. That's why we do it. We're told to do it. And I've given you the reason of why we go through it. So that your old man can go down and your new man can come up and all of your sins can be washed away. So make sure you get it done. Amen. Um, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God puts his spirit inside of us to seal us up. We're the only ones that can break the seal. People contend with that statement that I make. But God is a God of free will. And if you don't want to be saved no more. You can you just be like, God, I'm tired of it. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's you breaking the seal. OK, that's the only way that, that the, the enemy don't have the, the, the enemy don't have the power or authority to break your seal. He can tempt you to get you to break your own seal. You're sealed up. Imagine uh, you're being put in an envelope and that envelope is sealed up. Nobody has the authority to to break that seal open. But the Lamb of God. And you, you can break that seal by saying, I don't want to be saved no more. I don't want to live according. To, and you go on about your life and you're perish with the rest. Amen. The, the enemy don't have all he can do is tempt you to make you try to do it against yourself. So that's why God gives us his spirit so that he can be inside of us. His spirit is constantly uh, uh, transforming us on the inside out giving you a hunger and a thirst of righteousness, making you, moving you towards prayer, uh, uh, getting into the doctrine of, of the word of God. You know, it's moving you towards those holy and godly things that when you were in, as a natural man, you thought these things were foolish. Now, because you're spiritual, having received the spirit of God and you're spiritual, these things are not are not foolish to you any longer. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. God is always trying to call us out of darkness, but it's up to us if we're willing to come into the light that he's that he offers us. He's always the invitation is always there, but it's up to you if you're going to accept it. And it don't matter where you come from or what you or what you've done. What matters is what you're willing to do at this point. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That applies to us today. Save yourselves from this crooked or perverse generation. That applies to us. That's what we've been reading about in Isaiah, about those that didn't separate themselves, those that didn't call upon Jesus Christ to be Lord. Amen? And that's what, that's what Peter is constantly telling us. We've got to take this thing seriously. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And now, and here is another path set before us how to grow stronger and closer to God. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers. God keeps, when, whatever God used to get you saved, whether it's Bible study, uh, you, 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 you started 
following a friend to the place of worship and, and you received, you, you started receiving some truth. Whatever God has done to get you on the path to salvation, it takes a, a practice and a continuation of those things to keep you getting stronger. It takes a daily dose or, or a regimen of those same activities to not only get you stronger, but to see you to the end. Once you start pulling back on those things, then you're in danger of falling back. And once you're in, da once you're, you're in danger of stopping, and from stopping, you're in danger of falling back, which, in, which is backsliding. So don't stop doing those things that got you to where you are. It, you, it takes a continuation of that, a regimen of that to keep you moving forward. Amen? Uh, verse 43, fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were, com were together and had all things common. This is the brotherhood. It's talking about the brotherhood. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. God, we take this opportunity to thank you for the path of salvation, for the gift of life, the gift of eternal life with you and with Jesus, who is Christ. Father, I thank you also for calling all of us out of darkness and giving us an opportunity to take hold of that light. Father, those that have accepted the call, those that have accepted the invitation, we pray for them that you help them to remain repentant. Father, that they accept Jesus as Lord, and that they become sons and daughters of God and not return back to their former lust. We pray for them, Father, that you would place them in places of worship, Father, to where they can not only worship you, but magnify Jesus and edify our brothers and sisters. We pray that not only you fill them with the Spirit of God, but that you also give them an understanding of their gifts and calling and use them for the sake of your glory. It's our petition for those whom you've called out of darkness and have answered the call. Father, I thank you for increasing the size of our family and keeping the door open for us to become citizens of the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name, and we pray. Amen. Uh, this is Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. If you have any unrepented sin in your life, you won't be able to take advantage of these blessings. Remember, sin brings about curses. Obedience brings about your blessings, right? And so this is a blessing. The word bless is littered all in this, right? But you can't let curses, you know, be a soldier at the gate uh, warding off your blessings. You know, because you, you got sin in the gate, so curses is standing outside of the gate, may, you know, bombarding any blessings that would otherwise enter in. So you got to do away with, you got to get rid of the, 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 the sins in your life so that you can dismiss the curses that are standing guard. Uh, I watch, my wife and I, lately we've been watching The Lord of the Rings. I don't remember, there's three of them, man. <laughs> and if you ever go back and watch those, I mean, those like, if you watch all three of them, that's a good 12 hours, right? But they're very, if they, they really do have such a spiritual meaning to it. I don't remember which one, if it's the first or the second or the third, but there was a king. And this king had this, this, um, like his 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 hand his his right hand person had put some kind of spell over him and so the king couldn't receive any counsel he was like a zombie he couldn't rule he he couldn't give good orders he couldn't call out good things he couldn't 
He couldn't acknowledge things. All he can do was be a servant to, the, to darkness because his right-hand person that didn't have his best interests at heart had a spell over him. It's similar to having, it's similar to having sin in your life. And that sin is stopping any goodness from coming at you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's deflecting any goodness from coming at you, right? And, and then outside of the, of the gates, it's got curses reinforcing the, the entrance to make sure blessings can't come in. That's how significant it is. So you got to make sure that you get sins out of your life so that you can fully embrace what God is trying to give you. Amen. Remember, it's a God of free will. So he is he he respects the fact that you choose curses over blessings. He respects that. Okay. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose this on you that you would receive it in Jesus name, that you prosper, that you're transformed and that you're anchored down in the will of God and that you place not only God, but his kingdom first, always at all and at all times that you yourself shall prosper. Receive the blessing in Jesus name. I thank you for your, your prayers and your proceeds and your support of the ministry. I love you. My wife and I, our family, we love you. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study.